call tonight's regular meeting of the Board of County Commissioners to order. Uh, go ahead and ask uh, Commissioner Lawhon for the invocation and Pledge of Allegiance. I invite you to bow, if you would. Father, we thank you for this day that you've given us to make decisions, to live life, to enjoy the blessings that you provide to us. We just ask that as we go through this meeting tonight that you would direct us in our decisions, uh, just make the decisions that are good for our county. And Lord, I ask that you be with all those that have, have or are fighting COVID. We just pray for recovery. We pray for our president, his wife, and all the others. Guide and direct us. In Christ's name I pray, amen. Thank you, Commissioner Lawhon. I ask at this time if there's any adjustments to the agenda. If not, we'll seek a motion to approve the agenda as presented. So moved. Motion from Commissioner Allman. Is there a second? Second. Second from Commissioner Furr. Any discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed, no. Motion carries seven to zero. Item number one on tonight's agenda will be a community transportation program. Um, Mr. Randy Shank. Good evening. Um, I guess you do have a copy of the hearing notice in front of you. Uh, um, just wanted to uh, go over the total project. If you look at the very bottom is $449,367. And this is gonna be split up into two portions, the first being the administrative grant, which is $246,167, and the capital portion of it, which will be $203,200. Um, just to point out for you on the local share, the county, the state has actually asked the county to prepare for a 20% portion on each one of those. That's a little bit different than all the previous years. Um, administratively, in the previous years, the county had been kind of on the hook for 15% and the state pushed in about 5% or actually 5% and on the capital side, the state put in 10% and then we were responsible for 10%. In this particular fiscal year 22, they've asked us to prepare for 20% on the local share on both of those. Um, I think you're well aware of the DOT fin finances at state level and that being the primary reason. They said it's not a for sure thing, but they just wanted us to prepare for that. Um, locally on the administrative side, our 20% would put us at $49,233 for our contribution and on the capital side, it'd be $40,640. For the worst case scenario for us, that would be Stanley County would be on be up for $89,873. Um, if the state does provide their portion, their 5% on the administrative side and the 10% on the capital, that would reduce us to a, a total of $57,245. And that's what we're going to anticipate. We prepared for the worst, but we really hope for the best. And we hope that they get their budgetary issues worked out. Thank you, Mr. Shank. Are there any questions for Mr. Shank from Commissioner? Mr. Chairman, I do have a question. Uh, Mr. Shank, in the administrative fund, it talks about uh, funding salary and benefits for three full-time and one part-time staff. Yes. Are those new employees or are those existing employees? No, they, they're existing. They, that's been, those employees have been there for quite a few years in that role. None of those are new. One of the big uh, portions of that is actually the vehicle insurance is covered in that, and that's right at $47,000 this year. <coughs> Any other questions from commissioners? If not, I'll declare the public hearing open. Is there anybody here to speak against the resolution? 
Anybody here to speak for the resolution? For or against? Final call. Declare the public hearing closed. What's the pleasure of the board? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Morgan. I move to approve the resolution to apply for and receive uh, 2022 Community Transportation Program funds from the Transportation Department. There's a motion to approve the resolution as presented from Commissioner Morgan. Is there a second? Second. Second from Commissioner Jordan. Is there any discussion on the resolution? All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed, no. Motion carries seven to zero. Thank you, Mr. Shank. Uh, next item on tonight's agenda is the North Carolina DOT fiscal year 22 capital purchase of service grant. Uh, Ms. Weemhoff. Right oh, here. Yeah. Right there. <laughs> yeah. Good evening. Mr. Chairman, commissioners, I'm here tonight to ask for your uh, approval for the NCDOT 5310 Capital Purchase of Service grant that Senior Services is applying for. Uh, the grant's in a total of $60,000, and this is about the, the sixth or seventh year that we've applied for the grant and have gotten the funds. Um, this grant allows us to provide additional transportation for senior adults 65 years of age and older, and we transport them to dialysis, to medical appointments, to the nutrition site, and some limited um, grocery shopping. Um, the match, the county has to, you know, we're able, the county has to put forth the match, but we're able to use our home and community care block grant funds for that match. So we're um, basically, the, there's no additional um, county funds required. And the nice thing about this grant is that we pay SCUSA to provide our transportation. So it's, the money certainly stays in the county by doing that. Thank you, Ms. Weemhall. Are there any mm -hmm. questions from commissioners? Seeing none, I'll declare the public hearing open. Is there anybody here to speak against the resolution? Anybody here to speak for the resolution? For or against? Clear the public hearing closed. What is the pleasure of the board on the resolution? Mr. Chairman, uh, I would uh, request approval of the program resolution and the uh, application for this grant. Motion from Commissioner Lawhon to approve the resolution in the application. A second by Commissioner Barbie. Is there any discussion from the board? All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed, no. Motion carries seven to zero. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Weemaw. Thank you. Item number three on tonight's agenda is a public hearing for the 2021 schedule of values. Uh, the tax administrator, Mr. Swearingen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. I guess it's public hearing night. Uh, <laughs> I'm also here for a public hearing tonight uh, for the 2021 schedule of values. Uh, myself and Charles Johnson were here at the September 8th meeting to present those schedules. And today we're here to have the public hearing. The public hearing was advertised in the September 13th edition of the SNAP as required by law. And unlike the other two, you cannot vote on this public hearing tonight. Uh, GS 105-317 says it has to be at least seven days after the public hearing before the schedules can be adopted. So public hearing tonight, and then we'll be back at your next meeting uh, on the 19th for the adoption. Any questions for Mr. Swearingen? You know, and I'll declare the public hearing open. Is there anybody here to speak against the schedule of values? Anybody here to speak for the schedule of values? For or against? Clear the public hearing closed. And this item has no action, so that will take us to item number four tonight. Thank you, board. Thank you, Mr. Swearingen. Number four is the amendment to section 618, uh, the solar energy power I forgot the last two letters. <laughs> Generating system. Generating Generating system, system sorry. Uh, overlay district. Uh, Mr. Rimsberg from the pl uh, the planning director and uh, Bailey Emmerich, planner. 
Good evening, board. It's good to see you this evening. Uh, and if I get my slide started here, boop, 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 that's not the button I wanted to hit. So we got it here from the beginning. There we go. All right, so good evening. We, we have uh, before you um, uh, a proposed amended language for the solar electric power generating system overlay district. Uh, I don't need to go into a huge amount of detail with that because we've, we've uh, had this kind of before us uh, for a while. And of course, it actually came as a request from the Board of Commissioners that we look at uh, uh, this language and see if we could strengthen the information uh, as uh, and the requirements for the solar overlay district for this is primarily for solar farms so uh, this is the general idea I'm just going to run through some of the key changes uh, that uh, have happened in the proposed language that's before you it uh, you have a memo from uh, David Underwood vice chair of the planning board who chaired the the planning board meeting and that uh, uh, provides you with basically this, this similar information here I will not go through all of it but uh, here are the key points bullet points uh, this new amendment will clarify the difference uh, between minor and major solar uh, power, electric power generating systems or solar farms. Increase setbacks of structures and fencing from 10 feet, which is the current rule, um, or 25 to 50 feet if within 300 feet of a residence, to 250 feet on all property lines. Reduces the maximum height from 25 feet to 20 feet of structures um, related to the solar farm. Uh, increases buffer width from 10 feet to 100 feet and calls for a buffer to be 80 percent opaque within four growing seasons. Requires all electrical components to meet uh, National Electric Code requirements and UL certification. It establishes minimum specifications for commercial general liability insurance and additional insurance if battery storage is used. Uh, it allows a third party inspection firm to complete the annual inspections that we're going to require. Uh, for solar farms. Uh, requires notification of planning department and county fire marshal of additions or changes to the solar farm, its operation or ownership. Establishes a height limit of 24 inches for vegetation uh, growth outside of the buffer areas. So anything growing around the solar panels can only be uh, 24 inches before it has to be cut or uh, sheep brought in or some sort of way to get that down uh, to a lower height. Allows the use of civil penalties for failure to comply with the ordinance. It clarifies and increases what is to be presented in a preliminary plan for approval by commissioners, including battery specifications if batteries are utilized. Requires a phase one environmental site assessment prior to approval by county commissioners. It clarifies and increases what is presented in a uh, final site plan for approval by the planning department. Uh, including a decommissioning plan. It uh, specifies additional requirements for decommissioning plan, including a bond of $106,000 per kilowatt or under 50% of the estimated cost of decommissioning, whichever is greater. Clarifies specifications related to measurement of inverter noise. Uh, creates a requirement for groundwater monitoring program designed by an engineer or geologist uh, contracted by the county. Includes monitoring of groundwater for three years after decommissioning. Uh, requires uh, the owner to purchase any fire apparatus specific to the solar electric power generating system needed by the fire department which serves that facility. Uh, requires installation of fire hydrants every 500 feet around the perimeter of the solar electric power generating system and placement of chemical fire suppressants at each battery storage area and transformer. And then it requires creation of an emergency response plan. It also bans the use of materials containing PFAS, uh, except in batteries, and requires a separate decommissioning plan for any on-site battery storage system. Requires the middle of a site maintenance plan, requires decommissioning plan and bond to be reviewed and updated every five years in case of a change of ownership, and requires decommission to begin if the facility does not generate electricity for 12 consecutive months. Ah, now, if this is adopted, uh, this would likely be one of the most stringent uh, ordinance requirements uh, in North Carolina regarding solar farms. Some suggested updates are not items normally seen in a zoning ordinance like fire hydrants and fire suppression systems, groundwater monitoring, purchasing equipment for fire departments and requirements regarding electrical codes. Those are normally found in state fire and building codes. Um, the large buffer requirements may prevent uh, small 
kilowatt solar farms from being developed, uh, such as the one current, uh, the current one on uh, Hatley Road or the one under construction near Baden off uh, Broadway. And uh, that's, that's underway now. Hydrant and groundwater requirements will likely prevent larger uh, kilowatt solar farms from being developed. And that, that is that. So um, it's before you. Uh, obviously, it took a lot of work to get to this point by various parties involved. And certainly uh, uh, invite you to ask any questions if you, if you have any. Any questions for Mr. Rimsburg from the board? Mark. Yes, Mr. Rensburg, uh, yes. most of the time these companies that develop these solar farms end up selling them and moving on. And the, if the purchase of this property uh, is made an agreement between the property owners and the new power company owners, uh, will these same restrictions or same guidelines be adhered to by the new owners? Yes, be companies? because this is an overlay district, it, it run, as they say, it runs with the land. So and it does. does the thing I had in here about hydrants, I don't know how the hydrants got in there, but a lot of this rural area, they don't have county water right. available to it. That's true. And could there not be something done there, like a well or maybe uh, an, an electrical fires? Water's not going to do much good anyway. Right. Uh, so there'll be have to be foam trucks or whatever for the fire departments in that area to be used. So uh, if that's applicable to the company, then I can see. A foam truck versus fire hydrants. I don't know how the, the right the fire hydrants are only good for, uh, you know, the ground fire, wood fires, that kind of stuff. Right. And, uh, which will probably be needed if the growth dies out under these things. And I, I think a, a a well or a pond on the area that could suffice over fire hydrants would be acceptable, or in the needs of that, a fire department that would be, could be equipped with a foam truck for electrical fires. Right. And I know this is restricted, but we didn't have any restrictions at all before. And this is not just to protect the people who are not getting the solar panel farms. It also protects those that are going to get the solar panel farms and help them if the company goes out of business to get their land replaced or well, they right. can use it for something else. And even though it may look restrictive uh, to one point, I, I think that it's helping the taxpayers out in the county on both sides. Yeah. And I'll just kind of, Mr. Barbie, if I may, the, uh, obviously this, this is your ordinance, basically, as, as, as you adopt it. So if commissioners want to amend any language uh, in this part of this process, that's, that's within your purview. Are the ones on Hatley Farm Road, and you mentioned the one in Baden also, right. Are they grandfathered in, or would they also essentially be stopped? All, all currently permitted, uh, and you might say, a, I was about to say applied for. That's not quite right, but but there there are currently. Well, let me back up. The Hatley Farm or, or Hatley Road, not Hatley Farm Road. Hatley Road is one is actually an Oakborough jurisdiction, so it's that's not a county. One, the one on Broad, uh, Broadway near Baden, that is in county jurisdiction. That's under construction now. That's a very small, I think, it's five or eight megawatt uh, facility. Hmm? Is that the 40 acre property outside of Baden? This that's, side of Baden? That's right, yeah. Okay. It, it backs up even to the, the old golf course property. And then we have, uh, there's one permitted on, uh, uh, get my directions right here, uh, Aquadel. Uh, old Aquadel Road um, that's uh, called the St it's Stanley Solar is the name of the project. That one is, is grandfathered in as well as the Orion project which is north of Pfeiffer University. So those three projects are grandfathered in. Um, there are no other projects pending. We do have one application by Ecoplexus but that's um, they haven't proceeded past, they haven't even gotten to the planning board stage. So that one is, in my opinion, not grandfathered in. Any other questions from commissioners? Yeah, I'd, I'd like to make a statement. Go ahead. Go ahead, sir. I'd like to make a statement. I've talked to several engineers that do these solar farms. Uh, one actually was with the solar farm south of Oakborough, and the other one was at a, one of the solar farms in Rowan County. And I know that in here it said that uh, for bee foragers or whatever, the plants will be posted in there for this and everything. 
And the one engineer I talked to there in uh, Rowan County said that he had a job to check the temperature before and after the panels were installed. The ambient temperatures mm -hmm. were the same condition, the same today. And there was an increase in temperature of 15 to 20 degrees after the panels were installed, just the ambient air temperature. Right. And uh, that might not sound like a lot, but if you got bees foraging in that place and they fly above a, a screen, they're going to be fried. So that, that, that part won't work. And the other engineer that I was talking to, we seemed to be bombarded about three different companies at one time were trying to put solar panel farms here. And I asked him, I said, what is so great about Stanley County that you're trying to get all these solar farms in here? And he said, well, number one is the restrictions. You, you don't have any uh, restrictions to amount to anything. And number two, you got a lot of power line companies coming through here. He right. said, but, uh, and that stuck out in my head when he, the restriction part. So. I want to get that out. Thank you, yeah. sir. Yeah. Mr. Jordan. More comment than question, but if you find anything you can answer or uh, sure. comment back to, please feel free. Um, I am for some restrictions on solar farms because it's obvious from all the phone calls and emails that we've got over time, of course, that a lot of the, 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 the people who live in the areas that we have been currently examining feel right. like they vehemently do, do not want solar farms and that's okay i'm okay with that as a commissioner but I, I feel like this particular plan is incredibly restrictive so much to the point that if there were ever other places in the county that could benefit from them or where people may find a, a benefit from them it simply removes the option these are so over the top a 300 foot buffer we couldn't even have this building if we were held to that standard Walmart wouldn't exist if we, in fact, there's hardly a business in Stanley County that has 300 feet on all, all, all sides of its property. That's a ludicrous example um, to set or, or, or precedent to set uh, when the only other precedent is 10 feet. Right. Every other business can operate within 10 feet of the property line, every other business. This business has to be 300 feet. That's an entire football field. Uh, well, 250 minimum, 300 feet if within a residence. So, if you have two businesses side by side, that's two football fields that you'd have to give up. Nobody ha has that kind of land. This isn't a solar ordinance. This is a kill solar o ordinance, and and that's okay. But we might as well just be clear about what we're doing. Um, I don't understand the, and, and and this one's truly a question. I actually don't know. What's the reason for groundwater monitoring? I think as you hear the other presentation tonight you'll probably hear some of, of the the justification for that um, the language that you see some of which you know didn't necessarily originate with the county staff so it, it came from outside sources uh, and were suggested to us so that's why you see some of the language the way it, it is including um, well, what, what's another example of a business that has groundwater monitoring requirement uh, yeah, well, any any large manufacturing plant, or, or and it's usually more of a post manufacturing. If there's a situation where um, there's been potential for ground contamination, I can think of examples of. Uh, this is kind of in the past with underground storage tanks. That was a really big issue with uh, with uh, with gas stations, and the issue with with contamination of well water in surrounding areas. So that was a big big deal for for having monitor wells. And that's what ground monitoring systems put in. So that was a, in any place you've had contaminated soil for, for whatever purpose. And I guess I could point to some place like Alcoa or other places, which are generally historical industries that have, have you know, back in the day, there weren't so many regulations and, and dumped things on their grounds or nearby. Not any modern so. business in the county that you can think of. <laughs> Off top, of my, off top of my head, I, no. The obvious stuff, the uh, gas station, yeah. that makes right. total sense. I, I, right. I really get that. It just and and I, the the requirement of a fire hydrant every 500 feet, as Commissioner Barbie already said, that one baffles me, because you don't fight fires at a solar farm with water. You fight fires with AAA foam, and uh, um, a fire. It, it, again, it just seems like we're intentionally throwing as many darts at the wall as we can to make them stick just to be sure that Stanley County never has a solar farm and as long as we're okay with doing that that's fine but I think it needs to be really clear what the goal of this is is to be sure that there's never a solar farm in this county 
uh, after this or ordinance passes. Right. Because I don't, I don't think there could be. I guess that's it for my comments. I, I got to, I got to throw something in about the, the water. It was more or less the water contamination. Any construction work above ground has to be done. Has to be quarantine off, so to speak. We're run off, won't get into creeks and streams and whatever. Right. And when you've got a lot of grading going on and solar panels going on, you're going to have that same situation, and they seem to be exempt from all that. And I, I know the pipe founders here right now, they've got to build several catch basins right now, right. ponds for runoff, and I see that no different for a solar company that's coming in. Uh, and as for, I agree with the fire hydrants here at 500 feet, that's a, that's a lot, but uh, there's going to be a lot of acreage there too that's going to be growth going on in the wintertime when it dies down. If there's a battery plant catches on fire, then they, normally the grass and the weeds or whatever's going to be out there is going to catch on fire too. So I do think there's some water resources ought to be there, whether it be fire hydrants or whatever. Thank you, Commissioner Barbie. Any other questions from board members? If not, Mr. Rimsberg, okay. we'll reserve the right okay. to <laughs> Call me back. bring you back. <laughs> no problem. Thank you. <laughs> All right. From the sign-up sheet, it appears that the bulk of you are here to speak for this public hearing. Um, I will remind you of the ground rules for public hearings. Um, we will adhere to a three-minute time limit uh, for speakers. Um, that is the agreement that this board typically uh, adheres to for public comment. And County Manager Lucas will actually have some signs to uh, help you out time uh, that way you don't have to keep looking at your watch other than that I'm going to declare the public hearing closed or open sorry is there anybody here to speak against the resolution or the ordinance speak against yes. my name is Wayne Coble I own approximately 145 acres <clears throat> of property in Stanley County, and I have some concerns regarding the zoning changes. Bottom line, some of the changes appear to be arbitrary, impulsive, and inconsistent with zoning ordinances. Arbitrary since the setback for the SCPGS far exceeds the requirements for an industrial classification. 250 foot setback, 100 foot buffer are utterly arbitrary and not very well thought out. If this is what the planning board and commissioners want, then just pass a moratorium on solar farms for Stanley County because these changes will most likely have that impact. It seems impulsive that you're going to single out of solar farms and penalize them, but still allow heavy industrial facilities to be constructed with much lesser restrictions for setback and no buffers. Some of these facilities are much more of an eyesore than a solar farm, like a junkyard. It appears there's some inconsistency with the minor SCPGS designation and the major SCPGS designation. Given how the minor de definition is defined, it would allow a large solar facility to be constructed on any site and generate up to two times the amount of power used on the same property. So if a heavy industrial facility wanted to build a 100 or 200 acre farm, none of the major SCPGS requirements would apply. This sure appears inconsistent with what you're trying to prevent. In my opinion, the definition of a minor SCPGS should further be clarified and restricted. Or if a minor solar facility is going to encompass more than a certain amount of acreage, the restrictions for the major designation should apply. Due to the arbitrary, impulsive, and inconsistent language in these changes, a much more in-depth review by an impartial person should be conducted to address legality issues with these changes. There are other issues with these changes, but in the essence of time and given my previous experience with this commission, I doubt what I had to say tonight will change anything. I just wanted to speak publicly regarding the concerns about these changes and be on record. Thank you for hearing what I had to say. We will rotate to the against speaking against to speaking for any a speaker that would like to speak for the ordinance mr brown thank you mr chairman and members of the commission i stand before you speaking in support of the revisions to the uh, ordinance 
I note for your attention that this comes as a recommendation from the planning board. Uh, this matter was vetted extensively by that board back on September 15. There's nothing radical as I see it with the uh, proposed uh, uh, adjustments here. These are common sense adjustments, common sense regulations, I believe. They put into practice sound, sound business procedures here, not only for today and for tomorrow, I'm going to reserve the balance of my time and yield that to Mr. Sigvarla, Mr. Vannevar, or Mr. Ellison. Uh, at this time, I introduce to you Richard Vinroot, one of North Carolina's most respected attorneys, who will handle the balance of our presentation here. Thank you. May I remove my mask? I'm Richard Venrood. I appreciate this opportunity, and thank you, Charles, for your nice introduction. Uh, I'm here to tell you that we're going to hear from three people that I regard as a, really a dream team for your local government to be able to hear talk about the, the suggestions being made that, as Charles said, were adopted in a near unanimous decision of your planning board just three weeks ago. Uh, of the three people, uh, they're going to talk to you about the reasons we have recommended the things that we're recommending to create for you, I think, what will be a model ordinance of this sort in this state. Uh, the first person is John Scavarla, who is a lawyer in Raleigh, but among other things was secretary of the Department of Environmental Quality under the McCrory administration. And then you're going to hear also from uh, Dr. Dan, Don Vandervart, who succeeded him as the secretary of the Department of Environmental Quality. And then finally, for Mike Ellison, who's with W.K. Dixon Company, who's worked for 30 years uh, consulting with cities like my city of Charlotte and others to talk about water quality and preservation of your environment. Uh, these are all people who I think are, are well equipped to tell you the reasons for the suggestions. You have a magnificent county. You have a beautiful environment. And, and you're about to be invaded by solar farms the size of the football stadium in Charlotte multiplied by 12 in one instance out here just six months ago on pristine farmland who will bring with them uh, elements that are, in my view, a ticking time bomb. And in nowhere in this state have people adopted the sort of reasonable ordinance with protections to deal with the things that will happen when these things finish their life and leave you with the aftermath and in the meantime create the risk that you're going to have to endure. This county really ought to do it right. You have a lot to protect. You have a good reason to do so. Uh, and you're going to also hear after hearing from these men who I regard as premier experts in environmental quality and protection of your environment in this county and across the state uh, from two of your own citizens, Mr. Robert Swain, who lives here and who spoke to the planning board and Roddy Dowd, who is a citizen here for many years and is bringing what I regard in my city as a former mayor, is one of the two or three premier businesses in our community to this beautiful county. I regret that for us, but I uh, am thrilled for you and people that live here, the people that will work there. And the things that they must do to protect you when they come with that size plant ought to be shared by other businesses that will endanger you as much or more than those ever will. And for that reason, I will stop talking and let the first of those people uh, speak Mr. to you. Mr. Venru, I, yes, I hate to interrupt, and I appreciate your introduction. But yes, sir. In, in order to maintain fairness, yes, sir. I'm going to rotate back I, to an opposition. That's no um, problem for us. No in, problem in at that, all. In that case. No problem and at all. That's we'll fine. allow everybody to speak, but I just want to maintain fairness. I think fairness. that's quite fair, and thank you, sirs. Thank you. Anybody else to speak against? I saw somebody. Yep. Good evening, Commissioners. Uh, thank you for having me tonight. My name is Philip Martin. I'm the Director of Community Engagement for Ecoplexus. I'm here to speak against the, the proposed changes to the ordinance. Um, I've spoken to many of you before. Uh, we have a project here in Stanley County. We've been working diligently on for about 15 months, um, trying to take in you know, suggestions from the community, from, from staff, uh, from business leaders, trying to, trying to make a, a good project. Um, 
you know, in a perfect world, I would love for this this to get tabled and allow us to 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 bring some insight from you know. I look at this ordinance and it it's obviously skewed to one side, and I'm sure you're going to hear um, from some folks after me that are that are on the opposite side of where I am, and I understand that. Um, but looking at some of these things, for the most part, we can make this ordinance work. Ecoplexus can. Uh, there's a few sticking points that I would just like to look at and possibly add some flexibility to. Um, it's been mentioned a few times here tonight, the, the, the hydrants. Um, you know, we're dealing with a, an area that has no water or sewer. Um, you would also not want to fight a, a electrical fire with water. Um, we had multiple meetings with the Oakboro Fire Department, the, the county fire marshal. We had agreed to spe uh, specialized training for them as well as any equipment they might need uh, to feel comfortable with our with our project. So that's on that or, that part of the ordinance. I would like for y'all to look at that and just you know maybe open it up to if the the jurisdiction fire department and the fire marshal are okay with our emergency response plan and they feel comfortable that we've met their needs. I think that should be sufficient if they can give you that comfort that they feel good about it going out there. I think that, that would solve that problem. There's enough fire codes from NFPA 855, 170. There are already statues in place that, that show how to do that. Uh, groundwater monitoring, you know, we're fine with that baseline testing. We can do that, but I ask you, what other businesses in Stanley County, you know, we're gonna, we're not, all, the only thing that's in the ground is the steel for the racking. That's it. We have less runoff than any other type of development, but we also have BMPs in place for our stormwater runoff. And pristine farmland, we have 25% of our, our project is perfect ag. Um, so what, do, what are our landowners supposed to do with that? If there's no water and sewer, they're not, they're not gonna be able to subdivide. So what about their property rights? So I just ask for a little flexibility in this ordinance so we can still have some solar, even though that you still have the protections, but we can still build projects here. Thank you. Pardon? Who was first, Mr. Bennett? Who did you want to speak first? Okay. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, I'm John Scavarla. Uh, I spent two years as the Secretary of Environment and Natural Resources and then moved to the Department of Commerce as Secretary there. So I've had the good fortune of seeing solar from not only the environment side, but from the commerce side. And I can assure you that the regulations as proposed are designed to do four things. One, health and safety. We have to think forward. And we, think, we need to think about the immediate health and safety, but the long-term health and safety. Two, what about first responders? We've talked about fire. It's an immediate issue. What about our first responders? Thirdly, the environment. And there are other environmental issues that I will leave to Dr. Van de Vaart and to uh, Michael Ellison and to Robert Swain. Uh, they are very, very knowledgeable. I had the good fortune of working with Don and Michael at Diener. And Commerce and Diener were integrally entwined simply because the need to grow and develop the economy of this state rests on both sets of shoulders. And last but not least, and probably the most important, what are the unforeseen burdens of taxpayers? Because it's really up to this commission to make sure that regulations are in place that 5, 10, 15, 20 years from now, there isn't something that really was an unforeseen burden. And we've got to address that. You know, you think about solar, intuitively it's a panacea. Free energy from the sun. But unfortunately, all that glitters is not gold. Because from a commerce perspective, solar is not an economic driver. Solar as a standalone business would not exist if it weren't for tax benefits granted by the state government. Solar as a standalone business would not exist if, if there wasn't mandates that so much of our energy come from alternatives. Solar is also not a job creator. One minute, I better, I better talk fast. Bottom line is, 
it is not a job creator. There's been a lot of numbers bantered about about how many jobs were lost in the pandemic, pandemic and solar, and I can't come close to trying to, to figure out how those numbers are determined. At the end of the day, the burden of co the cost of solar, which is higher, falls on the poor because you must have redundant sources of energy to back up nighttime and when there's cloud cover. Battery storage does not work. There was a multi-million dollar endeavor in Charlotte to create a company called Alevo that was going to solve the battery storage problem. It's been long gone. Gentlemen, at the end of the day, you have the opportunity to create a gold standard for regulations for Stanley County, for the state of North Carolina, and candidly a template for the United States of America. And I would implore you to, uh, to adopt the regulations as, as uh, presented. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Scavarlo. Is there anybody to speak against, another speaker against the resolution or the ordinance? Recognize another speaker for the ordinance? <coughs> Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much. My name is Don Vandervart. Uh, I had the pleasure of working with John and uh, taking over as secretary for the, the Department of Environmental Quality, but I worked all my life in the environmental field. And what I'm here to tell you is to please look at what the rest of the state is doing, what other counties are doing, which is there's now been the realization that after the first about eight years where everyone thought this was, uh, you know, there was always good, 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 win, win, win. We now recognize that there are uh, metals that leach into the groundwater and there is a humongous amount of waste that's going to enter North Carolina's waste stream in about 18 to 25 years. And at the North Carolina state level, there's been legislation passed. I serve on the North Carolina Environmental Management Commission. We are now reviewing the options for the millions and millions of spent solar panels that are going to enter the waste stream in about 18 to 25 years. Uh, the recycling is not working right now and the manufacturers of these solar panels are actually putting less valuable components in the current solar panels, which is good in terms of buying solar panels, but it makes those panels less valuable for the possibility of recycling in the future. So it is absolutely imperative that we do something now to prevent the kind of legacy disaster that North Carolina has had to deal with in coal ash. It's a very similar situation. The, 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 the volumes are immense, they're high volume, they're, they're relatively low, uh, uh, low risk. But in uh, California, they're currently being designated as hazardous waste. In North Carolina, where we're headed, I'm sure it's going to be a universal waste, which is a hazardous waste. Uh, and it's going to have to be landfilled, and that costs a lot of money. So all I'm, I'm, I'm preaching is, is that the please look into the future, consider what the rest of the state is already considering. We've got 20 counties that are already putting in place some kind of assurances, financial assurances, and I'm begging you to look into the future to make sure that you're not left holding the same kind of bag counties with coal ash. Uh, ponds are dealing with. Uh, the ratepayer is going to ultimately pay that, but you don't have that the luxury uh, in this case. Thanks very much. Thank you, Mr. Vandervart. Is there a speaker against? Another chance for a speaker against? Recognize another speaker for the ordinance. Good evening. <clears throat> My name is Michael Ellison. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I've spent about 30 years uh, working all over the country, working on permits, working on cleanups, restoring abandoned mine lands, cleaning up old hazardous waste sites. Um, and I would tell you that it's a lot easier to have your regulations in place and have the applicants go through a reasonable process than it is to come back later and have to clean it up. Um, in the interest of time, I want to quickly hit a couple of the questions. Um, one, why groundwater monitoring? Well, uh, utility scale solar power generation, storage, and transmission, it's an industrial land use. 
Recent studies have shown that there are heavy metals, strontium, including selenium, nickel, and some others, that are either toxic to aquatic animals or phytotoxic, meaning they kill plants, um, that can, can come off of these structures, the, the, the photovoltaic panels, and get into the soil and the groundwater. Recognizing the beauty of Stanley County, I mean, you guys are between the, the lakes on one side, the Rocky River, the Rocky River is, is recognized all across the state for its, its very high ecosystem quality. And trying to protect those water resources, recognizing a largely rural population, many of, of your citizens rely on groundwater for their homes. And you've got lots of rocky outcrops and, and rocky slopes that directly recharge groundwater. So the monitoring program is intended to establish baseline levels, which protects everyone, because if some of these things, some of these constituents are in there at, at higher levels, then, then the solar facility is not responsible. And monitoring through the operation and for two years after decommissioning helps the county identify a problem and, and get it fixed, protect public health and the environment as quickly as possible. Um, Foam, water, electrical fire. Uh, foam works sometimes on electrical fires. The fact is that the lithium ion batteries uh, generate something besides a fire. They generate something called thermal runaway. Thermal runaway can generate temperatures of 1,000 degrees. There was a facility in Arizona just last year. You hear Tesla's blowing up all the time. Facility in Arizona just last year had a foam suppression system did not work. The two rural fire districts sent four men each. One had been trained, the other had not been trained. And so they all got there, the hazardous response units got there. Uh, the fire looked like it was out, but these high temperatures from the thermal runaway from the chemical reaction in the battery, which could be cooled with water, uh, blew up and eight guys went to the hospital. So uh, there are rational reasons and, and, and reasoning behind what's been proposed to protect public safety and, and property. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody to speak against? We'll recognize another speaker to speak for. Before the next speaker starts, I will notify the public that I am related to the next speaker, just to be fair. I'm going to turn the gavel for the next speaker to Mr. Commissioner Morgan, just to monitor time. I think that's the fairest way to do that. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> I'm Robert Swain. I've lived in Stanley County since 1973, and I've installed solar systems for various companies. I will say this, and a lot of people in this room know it, I installed the first solar panels at the Pentagon back in the 80s. These panels, and even today, these panels are very inefficient. I don't care what anybody tells you, when you're talking 23% power generation, they're not worth the money you pay for them. Uh, the panels at the Pentagon were for experimentation and working, trying to figure out what they could do to develop these systems. I didn't see a lot of output from them. Uh, with that said, I can't stand here tonight and tell you how you would fight a fire, a battery fire, with, at the systems or with the systems that they are proposing. So far, I don't exactly know which battery they're going to use. I don't think they know which battery they're going to use. It's changed three times. These batteries are very explosive. Uh, the manufacturers, actually, if you read NFPA, they refer you right back to the manufacturers and they tell you manufacturer's instructions for fighting these fires. Uh, the fires themselves, once they start, you've got to have something on hand to put that fire out. A lot of times it may be water that they want you to put that fire out with. Uh, in that case, you're going to have to have a lot of water there in a short amount of time. Uh, other times, they tell you foam is the only thing that will squelch these fires. 
So with that said, I'm going to tell you until you have a final design, you can't sit up here and say, I approve this and this is what we're going to put in Stanley County because you don't know how you're going to fight this fire if there is a fire. Uh, the other thing I'm going to say is that I would ask the board uh, not to approve any of this until you see a final design and you see an engineer stamp on these drawings that somebody knew what they were doing. Because right now, it's, it's something that is a design build and this is what we hope we're going to put out there. And uh, that's all I'm going to say about it. I'm, I'm not used to dealing with millions of dollars worth of taxpayers' money and putting something in that I hope the power company is going to give them a break on in years to come. Uh, you're, not, you're not going to recover this money, taxpayers' dollars that you put in this project. I can tell you that now. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Twain. And I will pass the gavel back to Chairman Swain. Thank you, Commissioner Morgan. Is there anybody to speak against? We will recognize another speaker for. Good evening, Commissioners. Uh, my name is Roddy Dowd, and I'm here uh, on behalf of a lot of folks um, that live in the western part of the county. Jay and I have owned uh, farms here in Stanley County for almost 30 years, and we're proud to uh, call the county home and appreciate the people and the quality of life here. The amended regulations offer much needed revisions which should be incorporated into our code. They adopt best practices for dealing with solar farms, practices that good responsible environmental stewards and regulators know need to be put into effect. These revisions protect the environment in the county, but importantly, they make sure that the uh, citizens of Stanley County do not have to foot the bill for the future remediation of failed solar facilities. As I said, I speak on behalf of many citizens who support these changes. They are not here tonight because they want to be respectful of social distancing. But if I might, would some of those who agree with the revisions please stand up? Thank you. These are common sense solar development standards. And if you have heard from the other speakers, uh, a lot of these solar farms are oversold in their utility uh, to the public. Their power generation is unreliable, it's expensive, and it's dirty. And it wouldn't exist without the mandate the state put on uh, Duke Power and other utilities to purchase it. I might add that these are major industrial facilities. And right now, there's nothing in your regulations that's going to prevent an abuse of environmental um, uh, standards out there. Big industrial facilities are generally regulated by the Corps of Engineers, the state EPA, and the federal EPA. But yet, in your regulations, none of those entities have purview. So this is just putting kind of uh, an overview that would be on a large industrial facility. I would urge you to adopt these regulations. We do not want Stanley County to be a dumping ground, an easy picking place for these solar farm developers from out of state. I hope you will carefully endorse these carefully crafted amendments. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Dowd. Another speaker against. We'll recognize another speaker for. Thank you for allowing me to address our county commissioners tonight. Uh, my name is John Crosby. I am not an expert. Uh, I'm a property owner and a taxpayer here in Stanley County. Uh, God has blessed me with the stewardship of about 100 acres uh, <clears throat> of beautiful property near Oakboro. I was extremely concerned <clears throat> when I heard of the proposed solar farms and then found out that Stanley County 
does not have zoning regulations for that type of business. I believe that there must be appropriate regulations for any individual or business activity on property in Stanley County, especially those that will affect our natu natural resources. <clears throat> I was encouraged when the planning board approved the proposed zoning regulations for solar farms that, uh, that the presenters have, have talked about tonight. Um, this is not intended to be a comprehensive list, but from my memory of that planning meeting, these proposed regulations provide sp specific guidance for a detailed business plan, independent determination of baseline values for natural resources to be affected, monitoring of water and soil during and after operations, and a guarantee for payment of decommissioning and environmental remediation costs to restore to the baseline <clears throat> values. The decommissioning and environmental remediation costs are potentially large and, and ongoing future expenses. Any costs that are not paid by the business would ultimately be a burden on the taxpayers of Stanley County. Therefore, the funding must be guaranteed. Stanley County is pristine and prosperous due to the good decisions made by our leaders and community, past and present. You have another landmark decision before you now. Your approval of these proposed regulations will help ensure the preservation of Stanley County's natural resources and protect our taxpayers. I absolutely support your decision to approve the proposed regulations. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you, Mr. Crosby. Is there a speaker against? We'll recognize another speaker for. Oh, is there one coming for against? Against. Okay, come okay. forward. Sorry. Good evening, my name's Lynn Honeycutt. I'm from Oakboro. I'm here tonight to speak on behalf of my deceased mother-in-law, Elizabeth Honeycutt. She's lived in Oakboro for over 70 some years. Um, I feel like that we need to table what you're looking at this evening. There's still a lot of questions that need to be answered and I feel like we need to get a committee of uh, some, maybe some farmers and we, I represent some people that are against what's being spoken for at this moment. So please reconsider what you're looking at and let's get together as a committee and let's make some changes as Mr. Coble said tonight also. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Honeycutt. Now is there another speaker for? I have one more name on the list, but we're not gonna forbid you from speaking. Or? Come on forward. Good evening. Um, my name is Joanne Hesley, and I am a resident of the Oakboro area. Um, I just wanted to share a couple of thoughts, more emotional than um, scientific and that type of thing. Um, one of the things I, that stands out to me when I look at, uh, looked at the other day at the Stanley County website was this quote. It says, <clears throat> for a place so wide and open and free, the feeling of connection and intimacy is immediate. Part of the closeness is the residents who call Stanley County home. These suggested regulations are not arbitrary. They are very specific and intentional, and we are trying to protect our county, its wildlife, its natural areas, the people and the land. After all, the logo for our county is Stanley County, water, air, land, success. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hesley. Anybody against? Speaker against. Speaker for. Last call. 
against. Last call for. Clear this public hearing closed. Any questions from commissioners? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Morgan. I guess this is more of a statement. Um, you know, I've been, with this issue, I've been on the fence on both, I, I see both sides. And I understand you gotta have, you, there's gotta be some type of restrictions and, and some kind of ordinance in place. But if we approve this as it says, everybody just wasted their time because basically you just said Stanley County is open for any seller at all. However, I think with some changes to this, um, I, I, I feel would still give people their right. I, I'm a big believer in property rights. I, I believe if you own that property, you should be able to do within the law of the land what you wish with that property. If that means putting a solar farm arm to save that person's farm or 200 acres, then, what, then that's what it's gonna be. But, with some of this, I think it's just, it's so restrictive. I mean, 250 feet setbacks from all structures. Um, this, this is just a couple of, of the issues that I have. Um, I do agree, and I've always said that since I've been on the board um, with the decommission and plan and bond. I believe that's, that, should evolve, that should always be in place. Um, and it does protect the landowners and the county itself. Um, the other issue I have is Commissioner Jordan and uh, Barbie has stated with the fire hydrants. Um, there's no way you're going to get fire hydrants out in the county around 800 acre um, or 900 acres, whatever you want to call it, a uh, large solar farm. There's no way you could, you could get fire hydrants every 500 feet. I mean, it's just not possible. Um, maybe if we can agree, come to it, whether it's one or two retention ponds to hold water in case of something like that, I, I, that I could go along with. Um, Also, um, I still have concerns about acreage versus from, uh, I don't like how you, just, how you clarify between minor and major because I think it should go off of acreage. 40 acres, 50 acres should be considered a minor versus how, how it goes. Um, I, I don't like that part of it. Um, and as far as, I mean, like I said, I'm not, a, I'm not a big fan of solar farms simply because I believe they're basically tax funded. You know, w without tax fund, there's no way solar farms. So I, that part, I, that's why I fight. But I think it's still, it gives, each individual has a right to make money it, however they see fit. It may not be right in my eyes or your eyes, but if that landowner wants to keep that property, I think that's their right. Um, and I, I just think this is getting too restrictive. Everything else, like I said, I think I could, I can pretty much go along with. Um, the groundwater monitoring, I was kind of on the fence until y'all spoke and that kind of uh, changed my mind on that. So, 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 I mean, I could still understand that, but it's the setbacks. Um, even the, bu I mean, you're increasing the buffers from 10 feet to 100 feet out in the country. Um, so, I mean, I, uh, there's got to be some give and take, I think. Um, uh, other than that, I have no problem with it. Um, and I'll let the rest of the commissioners say. Um, I don't know if I, you, pardon me. <laughs> I, May I speak? Public hearing is closed. Okay, well, I, I will. That's fine. I apologize, but just to maintain order. I was just giving you the time where I already spoke already anyway. So. Is there any other commissioner that wishes to speak? or ask questions. Mr. Barbie. Yeah, I, I agree a lot that needs to be worked on, but uh, the setbacks were, I think, put in place because uh, in this last track, there were so many individuals' property engulfed and encircled around solar panels that didn't want to see them. And the 250 setback with the uh, chance of uh, some vegetation to help block it was the main reason for this. Um, I feel for those people, I think their rights should be protected also, as long as I agree with property owner rights need to be protected also. What I'm really upset about is, is we pitted neighbor against neighbor, farmer against farmer, and friend against friend in this. 
and they're now all mortal enemies, those that want it and those that don't want it. And I'm aggravated that we have to sit up here and make decisions that we're not going to make everybody happy on. And no matter which way we go in voting, uh, it, it, there's going to be somebody mad. Uh, I think the best thing we can look at is here is we try to protect all citizens, and I think for the biggest part this does, but I understand too it needs work. Uh, I disagree with Mr. Morgan on the setbacks. I think in, if you had a house uh, and a solar farm went up beside it, you'd want more than 50 feet or whatever in vegetation separating your house from the solar panels. Uh, I know uh, it, it just, in certain cir circumstances, I, I agree, 250 feet may be too much. But um, I think the biggest thing is the way our property lays in this county. Uh, there's just too many avenues and hillsides and whatever that you're not going to be able to hide a solar panel farm, especially a large one. And my main consideration was in this and looking at it was to protect all the county citizens uh, from some point. I know I can't protect everybody and make everybody happy, but uh, I don't want to disarm uh, solar panel farms where they can't come at all. But by the same token, with they need regulations just like any other company. And I've heard the thing about, well, you, you can't require Walmart to, to back up 250 feet. Well, we're not. And, and, and that's a total different situation. Uh, they're not going out here and building in the fields and engulfing acreages around in their parking lots and stuff. So uh, I agree we need uh, more water, but I think, that, like you said, the fire hydrants are too much. The retention ponds, I think, would work good if we can work out some agreement in that. But I wholeheartedly believe that we need to go ahead and pass some kind of legislation tonight or re regulations and then work on the parts we need to work on to, uh, to make them fit. That's just my personal opinion. Thank you, Commissioner Barbie. Any other commissioner wish to speak? Mr. Chairman. Commissioner Morgan. I'm just going to say one in, in response to Commissioner Barbie about the setbacks. My understanding, and uh, correct me if I'm wrong, is the way it's zoned now, if someone, want, if, if a farmer wanted to go put a hog house or chicken houses up, there's no setback rules, is there? The, uh, any Accessory structure was it's very minor, it's ten feet uh, from the side or rear property line, fifty feet from the front. So it, it's just say I'm just saying an example. Say if a farmer wanted to go put four hog houses or ten chicken houses right beside, I'm sure some neighbors are not going to be happy about that. So there's no setbacks. So how, that's that's what I'm saying is, you, you, and I'm okay with hog farm. We I mean chicken farms. We need them. But what I'm saying, I'm just trying to make a point, is nobody is going to be happy whether nobody wants to look at one thing or the other. And I, I agree, I grew up in the country. So, I mean, it, it's kind of, I don't know, it, you can go either way. I, I see both sides. Thank you, Commissioner Morgan. I'd like, I don't really want to speak. I want to change a few things. Um, I would offer an amendment to the ordinance um, and, and not to change the setback, but it is item number two, and Mr. Rimsberg, if you want to, I'm going off of your memorandum from Mr. Underwood. I did not find the citation page. Uh, the required setback of all structures fencing from 10 feet uh, or 25 or 50 feet within 300 feet of a residence to 250 feet. I am personally okay with those numbers. I would if the board also agrees some language that allows a property owner to, I don't know, remove themselves from that, because that happened at Pfeiffer. Uh, with the Pfeiffer project, those, those neighboring property owners were for the project, and they, they all spoke and kind of waived their right to that, that border. But if the property owner is not, you know, then, then this stands. Um, I would offer that question to the board. We'll throw it out there. I'll throw it as a motion if somebody will second it. Uh, second from Commissioner Barbie on that. Um, is there discussion on that? Just to be clear, keep the, keep the setback at 250 and 300 if it's beside a residential. 
with the caveat that if the, the residential property in question chooses to forego that requirement, that it can be waived. Right. And if it's within 300 feet of another residence, they're not going to be able to do it anyway. So if it's close, close quarter housing, I don't know a better term, it's not going to matter either way. But if they're living out on a country road and they're the only house on the road and they don't mind looking at it, they can waive their right to it. Is that legal, Mr. Rimsburg? Yeah. I guess we should go with that first. <laughs> short answer I think is yes that I think it could be written in such a way to give a, adjoining property owners the right to waive the required setbacks for and would be very specific for the for solar farms only um, we it's sometimes difficult to make exceptions we do make exceptions for buffers there is already something in the ordinance that allows uh, an adjoining property owner to waive the uh, buffer requirements and I think that would still apply for buffers for solar farms as what well, cause it's across the board. We don't have anything in place currently that waives the right to setbacks. Just uh, in, in general, that's a board of adjustment question. You know, any sort of setback rules become a, a variance to um, things. But I, I, I think some flexibility could be given for an adjoining property to waive it. You may want to set a limit you know, up to certain percentage or, you know, half the distance or, or I don't know, some, some language, but. If there's flexibility for a variance already there through Board of Adjustments, I'll withdraw my motion. But I, I just want to make sure a landowner that doesn't object to this on a neighboring property has some right. rights that are protected. Setbacks can be a variance, so that, that, it, that would be true. So it could, it could, it would have to go before a public hearing that's fine. and you know adjoining properties notified that sort of thing that's fine then i would be. draw my motion on that um the next item i had and this is going to be only because i enjoy agriculture and is number nine establish a height limit for 24 inches for vegetation most native species of grass do not bloom and seed within 24 inches of vegetation so if we want to encourage native pollinators and things like that that don't get burned up by the solar panel um, in the first place, I would like to see that at least increase to 36 inches. And I'll offer that as an amendment to um, the order. Second. second from Commissioner Barbie. Is there any discussion on that? I'm not sure how to how to phrase this one because I'm not sure what the requirement normally would be. But um, again, I'm not I'm not you know if we don't have county water out out there at these places now. What do we do if a fire breaks out in the farm? We call the fire department. They roll pumper trucks. I would think it'd be the same for anything else. I mean. Um, if there's county water there, then we could require them to have a hydrant, okay, sure, or X amount of hydrants. But this seems like it's going to re require a, a, an incredible amount of actual county infrastructure to be run at millions and millions of dollars, not to mention some weird odd oddball number of a hydrant every 500 feet. How, how far apart, Bob, we have fire hydrants now in the county? That's not normally a zoning regulation other than it comes up from the fire marshal's office and what have you. When you're dealing with a subdivision. Is he here? Did Danny, is he, is Danny here? Yes. Or does anybody have it? It's typically longer than 500 feet. But, but, but are we talking 2,500 feet? Or? It's going to depend on what your fire rating is. I mean, obviously, in more densely populated areas where your fire rating is higher, where you have more water, and municipalities, your fire rating is going to be lower because you've got more water availability. You get out in the counties where, where you know, typically the water, the hydrants aren't as close, you end up with a higher fire rate. Let me think about, let me see if I, I can word this this way. It would require some, uh, an approved plan from the fire marshal's office, be it retention ponds, be it uh, uh, an agreement with the fire department to provide uh, extra pumpers, chemical pumpers, AAA pumpers, whatever that is. As long as they can provide something that would meet the fire 
requirement for a solar fire, I mean, you know, panel fires and, or, I'm sorry, electrical fires and or the potential for battery fires if they have a storage site, then I think we ought, ought, ought to be fine. If the fire marshal's office signs off on whatever the proposal is, then good. But just make a note that we, or, or, or make the amendment that we require some sort of approved plan from the client or the SCPG signed off by the fire marshal. Is that, does that sound better? Does that sound acceptable? I'll, we'll do that as a amendment. And I kind of devolved there for a minute. I apologize, Mr. Brown, for my parliamentary procedure. We should have voted on the first amendment before we produced another one. Um, I will uh, go back to the, the, the first amendment that I offered. I established a height limit of 24 inches for vegetation growth outside of buffer areas uh, to 36 inches. So that change would be from 24 to 36 inches. Is there any other discussion on that amendment to the ordinance as presented? Question. <clears throat> Sir? Is there a current height limit on vegetation? That'd be a question for Mr. Rimsberg. In the minimum housing code and high grass ordinance does have a requirement and that's primarily for, mostly for residential situations and I think it's 18 inches. Is it 24? It's 24. Okay. And that's a residential. But, but that's residential. Primarily at targeted or residential. So, I mean, obviously, you're not going to regulate a farm on height limits. The farm grows higher than that. And, you know, and you're not going to do that for, for um, most industrial properties either, necessarily, but, but for residential, the minimum housing, high grass. Mr. Chairman, would you give me an explanation as to why you I just stated it needs to be higher? I just think it needs to be higher because, like, if you look at the, the cultural habits of native species of grass, they don't even produce seed heads within that height. So, I, I mean, if we're talking big blue stem native grass that grows around here, then a, a stem height is going to be, in some cases, higher than 36, but it will seed in 36 inch height. So I just, kind of a, kind of a number, but, um, that's, that was my reasoning. No. Right. They're going to keep it below the panels. Right. Any other questions or comment on the motion? All right. We're voting only on the motion to amend item number nine. Um, as presented in the memorandum from David Underwood, um, establish a height limit of 36 inches for vegetation growth outside of the buffer as presented or as rewritten. All those in favor say aye. Any opposed, no. Motion carries seven to zero. The second amendment that was offered was item number 18 as presented in the memo. Um, and Commissioner Jordan, correct me if I'm wrong. You're you're saying strike the installation of fire hydrants every other every 500 feet and replace it with an approved plan from the fire marshal's office. In conjunction, I, you said something about uh, local. Yeah, approved plan from the, by the client or a plan from the client that is approved by the fire marshal's office that meets all the checklist requirements. Ultimately approved by the fire marshal. Did I catch that? that? Sure. Does that sound? He reviews other plans. Was that the fire marshal also? Yes. All right. So is there a second to that amendment that Commissioner Jordan has presented? A second from Commissioner Morgan. Is there discussion on the amendment number 18? Yes. That Would that ultimately have to come back before the commissioner for the planning and zoning board for that? Or would that automatically just, could you just go ahead and go to the fire marshal? Mr. Chair. Mr. Allman. Under, under number 18, 
if that is if that's brought back under our fire marshal we're expecting him to be an expert on solar is he an expert on solar I understand that, but it's not every day you fight a solar fire in Stanley County. I share Commissioner Allman's concern. Um, I have the highest faith in the fire marshal that we currently have, but we don't know who the fire marshal is going to be in the future. Um, you know, I'd, I would have a hard time supporting that amendment just to, to put that, but. Um, is there any other discussion from other commissioners? Mr. Chairman. Commissioner Morgan. And I, I, as far as this, this goes, I mean, I don't see any other way to word it without tabling all this all together tonight and then talking with Fire Marshal and getting more input. Um, I mean, because I can tell you right now, with that in there, in the first, I would never vote for this. Yeah, but I mean, I mean that's going to be how many hundreds of thousand dollars for a solar farm to run fire hydrants around? And I feel like the fire marshal has had to learn to cope with every other single line of business that's ever been invented. I mean, so I feel like a bunch of glass that doesn't move and sits there can't be that big a challenge. He's got more batteries and advanced auto than he's, he's going to have in a storage facility. So same problem, I would assume. I don't pretend to be a fire science major. I just mean, you know, whatever the problem is, that company's going to come to the fire marshal. They're going to work out a plan. That's how it was. That's how it's done now, anyway, right? Okay. So stick with that plan. We could just go. We're applicable fire hydrants, and we're not the containment ponds, which would be adequate to fight the fire. If, that, if that's what we're worried about, is the, the fire hydrants. Any other discussion, comments on the amendment? All right, the amendment as presented is to, for the, pres presumed applicant of a solar farm to develop a plan um, in conjunction with the fire marshal's office um, to, to have a, some sort of fire combat plan for the facility. Is there any other discussion on that amendment? I would say that we do pass the burden on to the solar company for purchasing any extra additional equipment that is outside our normal scope of firefighting. So if it's so, if you're going to bring a nickel iron sulfide battery to Stanley County, and we have none of those. We don't have the right chemicals. That's on the company to, to provide it. Would that be a logical addition? Are you amending your amendment? I'm amending my amendment. I didn't look. 17. That would be 17. All right. right so, so let's let's go back to the amendment. If there's no other discussion on the amendment for item number 18, uh, if you are in favor of amending that for an approved plan uh, from the applicant in conjunction with the fire marshal's office, please raise your hand. I'm going to record four votes. If you are not in favor of that item, please raise your hand. I'm going to record three votes. So it will be amended. Tyler, we may have to watch the video on this. <laughs> it will be amended um, uh, to a, have an approved plan on file from the client, whether that be any sort of um, whatever sort of fire combat plan is required. Any other comments or questions about the ordinance as amended? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Morgan. I'd like to know what everyone thinks about the setbacks. Are they, is everybody good with that? Because I know that, that was my issue. And then. I think all setbacks for the entire property would go to the variance board if they came in, or the board of adjustments. It, it, yeah, it could, or it could be specific to one a, specific one, adjoining one parcel section of property. Okay. Answer your question. 
Any other questions? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Allman. I make a motion to approve the uh, proposed amendment with the adjusted amendments. Motion to approve the ordinance as amended uh, from Commissioner Allman. Is there a second? Second. A second from Commissioner Furr. Is there any other discussion? All those in favor, please raise your hand. Any opposed, likewise? Motion will carry seven to zero. The ordinance will pass. Item number five on tonight's agenda is gonna be a debt refinancing proposal. Uh, presenter is gonna be Mr. Christopher Alexander. Good evening, uh, Chairman and members of the board. I wanted to speak to you tonight about an opportunity to look at means and methods of lowering the county's outstanding debt service. Uh, and this is in association with four different pieces of debt you currently have outstanding. Um, we've looked at the possibility of combining those four loans into one uh, loan as a 160A20 financing, installment financing that would be done as a uh, private bank placement. I believe you guys have uh, information in front of you showing the sources and uses of the funds and also the potential savings associated with this transaction. Uh, as of the week of the 21st of September, uh, we had estimated an average yield of 1.55% with approximately $35,000 cost of issuance to the county to be paid and it would generate j roughly $1 million, a little over $1 million in gross savings. All right, Mr. Alexander, are there any questions from commissioners? Just, just one, uh, spend 35,000, refinance all the debt, save a million. More or less. Long and short of it is that you're gonna take one of your loans that you issued last year in 2019. I believe it was for your EMS station. You had originally issued that debt for 20 years. The flip side is right now, if you were to combine all of these loans together and you were to go out and try to get another 20 year financing, the difference between a 20 year and a 15 year is gonna be pretty wide. However, if you look at that 15 year financing, if you're able to shorten that 20 year financing down into that 15 year period, the cost benefit associated with it will generate about $145,000 per year savings in those last four years. In the first, call it 11 years of the, of the refinancing, you're only gonna generate about 50 to $60,000. But again, over the life of the loan, you're gonna be generating close to a million dollars. I think it's $878,000 net present value. You other Chairman, I do. I have Mr. Long. a number of questions. Sure. Uh, <laughs> a lot of scribble, that's right. Uh, the terms on the loans that we have now, we know what they are. Yes, sir. Are any of these loans going, the terms going to be extended or shortened? And if they're extended, which ones? In the state of North Carolina, the local government commission will, will not allow you to extend the weighted average life of any of your financings after they're done the first time. Therefore, if you have a financing that's set to expire in 2035, you can never extend the life of that financing past 2035. As a result, the only opportunity that the county could look at would be to change the payment dates in order to stay within the auspices of the original uh, set financing. In other words, what you look at is you could potentially go from one payment a year. I believe, Andy, you can correct me if I'm wrong, I believe you have a payment in August, uh, you have a payment in September, and you have a payment on the 10th of October as well, as well as having payments on January the 9th for the loans of the bb &T. We would potentially set this up to have two payments on a per annum basis, one in August and one on February 1st. And by doing so, it'll reduce the interest cost, and it'll also make it so that the finance department is not having to worry about making eight payments a year, but now only worried about making two payments a year of principal interest. 
The one financing that would not actually be shortened would be the EMS station. Again, that has a final maturity of, I believe, 2039, and that has an interest rate of 3.19% per my notes here. That would be reduced in duration down to a final maturity no later than February 1 of 2036. Um, this is a question, uh, I guess, for you, Andy. Currently, are we paying monthly payments or semi-annual? Annual payments on all of our, on these four pieces of debt, we pay okay. an annual an annual principal and an annual interest payment. Okay, which I understand if we make two, it's going to sh shorten the amount of interest. Uh, is there prepayment penalties on any on this particular proposed loan? On um, on the proposed loan that would take these out or the existing loans? Proposed that are going to take these out and then I guess do we have prepayment penalties on any of the loans that we currently have? There are no, okay, <laughs> I don't want to cut you on Mr. Lucas. Uh, there are no prepayment penalties on any of your outstanding loans. They are all prepayable at par, in other words at 100 percent of the outstanding principal balance. Uh, however, all require at least 30 days notice in order to take them out. And so they can be paid off at any given time with 30 days notice. Now the refinance loan, we have not bid that out at this point in time. There is a potential that that could bring with it a prepayment penalty. Um, given what we've seen historically, uh, sometimes we'll see them in there at one, two, three percent. Typically, they fall off after three to five years, and so they're typically prepayable at par after five years. Again, this would be something that we would look at in the, the grand scheme of things. And to be honest with you, if you're getting a 150 or even a 175 all-in um, yield on a replacement loan, the likelihood of being able to generate at least three to 5% savings down the road would mean you'd need to replace that loan below a 110 or a 115 percent. How many loans did you say would be consolidated? Technically, you have uh, five loans. However, two of those loans were combined with bb and during a pre re previous rate adjustment, and I believe that happened in 2014. collateral for this particular loan that you're speaking of? What would be the collateral? That's still to be worked out with the banks. Obviously, we have not sent out any RFPs at this point in time, but we would look at uh, collateralization of the project that would most be beneficial for the county and would not um, create any type of encumbrances down the road for any of your future projects. Yeah, and, and the reason I ask that, I know there's some loans that fairly short maturity. Sure. That when they're paid, the collateral's free and clear to pledge again or do something with. Um, $35,000 fee. Understand the way I read it, 10 of it's kind of for attorney fees. The 25 is, I guess, paid to your company as a brokerage fee. Is that accurate? financial advisory fee for bringing the, the transaction to market, working with the local government commission to get the project through uh, completion, and then to work with and bid out any type of needs associated with that. And then obviously as uh, the county has needs in the future uh, to for me to work on this transaction or any issues that come about of it. The rates, the, the range of rates, are you talking about a fixed rate, adjustable rate, or a variable rate? These are fixed rates to final maturity. Uh, these were all uh, requested from three different banks. Uh, the first one came back on September 21st. The uh, second two came back on September 23rd. Again, they were not using uh, the county's name. They were simply asking the question of a final maturity no longer than 15 years out with a weighted average life of 5.1 years. Are any of those three banks local banks? Uh, headquartered? Have a program. 
I believe one has a location in Stanley County. The other two I do I know that do not. Could you tell me that who that bank is? Given the fact that I specifically asked uh, these banks for nondescript information, I have not, and I'm not hired by the county uh, with a contract at this point in time. It would be betraying the information that they've given to me and that I've been trying to protect the county from. Can you tell me, can you tell me uh, give me the FHN Financial. Where are y'all headquartered and are you all a brokerage, advisory? What do you do? FHN Financial is part of the original First Tennessee Group. It is now named First Horizon. First Horizon has branch locations in the Charlotte metro area, but we also have branch locations all the way down to Florida, all the way up to the Maryland border, uh, all the way down in Louisiana through the new uh, acquisition of um, Iberia Bank. As a result, we've become the top, one of the top 25 banks in the United States. FHN Financial is a division of First Horizons. And I actually worked for both First Horizons in the FHN Financial Group, as well as the FHN Financial MA. That's the Municipal Advisory Group. Let's say you come to the table, let's say we approve this, and you come to the table with a uh, hard offer, and we decide not to take it because we don't like the prepayment terms, we don't like collateral that you're requiring sure do you walk away with no cost walk away no no twenty five thousand nope okay i only walk away happy if you're happy okay thank you any other questions from the board if not what would you like to do mr chairman mr. i'd like to table this for two weeks because the local banks that we do business with Support lots of nonprofit organizations within Stanley County. They also, some of them, have also given substantial amounts of money for the Agri Civic Center Arena. And that two week period, I think, would give the Finance Department time to call the existing lenders that are in our market to see what kind of rate adjustments they could possibly give us to see if it's equivalent to what uh, Mr. Alexander's speaking about. So that's my motion. Motion to table um, the discussion on uh, item number five tonight. Is there a second? Second. Second from Commissioner Furr. Is there any discussion on the motion to table? All those in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed, no. Motion will carry seven to zero. Um, item number seven, um, I'm sorry, item number six is the small area water line project, uh, presumably Commissioner Lane Fur. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the uh, matter of here being, bringing this forward. The county started a new small water line extension program fiscal last year. The initial project, you know, was out in Webb Road. And the board may want to consider an adoption extension project to go to Balls Road on the fiscal year of the 2021 for amount not to exceed 200,000. Um, there is a map on the back side Approximately be going about 2,000 feet. Would be adding an extension in uh, to, to get us a little bit better going towards um, Canton Road. Considering and approving um, the authorization of this, um, engineering and subsequent the construction for a small water area line extension. And I would like to see if we can get this extended out. Uh, County Manager Lucas, what was the um, dollar cost on the extension for Webb Road? Do you have it? Uh, it was 
if I remember right, it was in the six fifty, six hundred fifty thousand dollars. And that was for two miles. For a longer, longer three longer miles stretch. Usually, we use about eighty dollars a linear foot is okay. the number we use for engineering and construction. That's the all in um, cost. The going rate's about eighty dollars a foot. And it, at this time, it would be because we haven't co that fund hasn't re regenerated. So this would be fund balance appropriated? Yeah, we could, um, this would either, likely what we could do is, um, if you took action tonight, we would bring back a budget amendment at your next meeting. Um, this would give us the authority to begin the conversations with the engineer and get it, get that process started and so that we don't lose additional time there. Um, and then we would bring back the budget amendment. I would say for a project this size that we would even look at retained earnings from the utilities fund, uh, maybe with some combination of general fund money like we did with Web Road. But I think, um, you know, if you're looking at around a $200,000 project, uh, I think that, you know, a portion of that certainly can be retained earnings from the utilities fund. And how many houses are beyond where this stops? There, where this stops, there aren't a, there are there are houses as you get closer to Canton Road. There's a pretty good area there if you look at the aerial map where there's really not much from a residential perspective. Um, this picks up the the the, the residential um, units that are closest to 2427, and then as you get closer to Canton Road, there are all, uh, some additional um, the the. Um, the the request we got for boss road came from the residents on the 2427 side so i think that's probably why commissioner fur was more inclined to say let's start there i do know that 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 boss road is also being considered as part of the phase four um water and sewer authority project and this would just basically take away from part of that and so that that water and sewer authority project could potentially finish this line because um, that's you know that's being considered as part of the boss roads can be considered as part of that contingency um, along with a couple other roads in the county and so this would just be less contingency money that would be needed for boss road on the on the water and sewer authority phase four project that we hope to get approved by USDA fourth quarter of 2020, first quarter of 2021. Um, but it'll all depend on where, what the engineering and construction bids come up, how, what, how much contingency there is and how many roads we can get to. But Boss Road is one of them that's been targeted. So this would just allow us to do that and then stretch those contingency dollars to other small area projects in, the, in other parts of the county. Any other questions for the county manager? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Morgan. Oh, yeah. Um, I was going to bring up about the phase four as well. I can't remember. So, um, is this already in phase four? No, it's, from our it's last not. Meeting. I know we've talked about it, but I know as far as that phase four, as far as you know, funding goes, like it's balance, balancing that to get the, the house median income right. at a certain level. Was yeah, the contingency money is really the county share of the or the utility water and sewer authorities funds. So really, those aren't necessarily the grant dollars. So they would want these additional contingency areas that you're picking up are areas that you don't wouldn't necessarily put in the project because they'll bring down the competitive competitiveness of that project. So these are just areas that were identified as areas in the county that we'd like to get water. Boss Road being one of them. I think Frick Road is another. Those are areas that we would have said we there's a contingency budget in the Water and Sewer Authority project budget that's being considered by the USDA at this point in time. But until we get the construction bids out there, we don't really know how much of that contingency could potentially get eat up, be eaten up within the project or whether that contingency money would actually extend. And those are water and sewer authority dollars that can be used for these projects, such as Boss Road, Frick Road, and some others that we may elect to do. Mr. Lawhon, I believe you had a question. I do. Um, I know there's also roads in Locust or Locust area, mm -hmm. and I'm not sure if they're in phase four or on the list, but a few. I mean, if we're going to take, what is it, uh, 1,750 feet Boss Road, which was talked about being in phase four, if we're going to take it, then You've got a street called Maple Street, from my understanding, 1,266 feet in Locust, Foxworth with 783 feet, Pine Ridge with 959 feet, 
Creek View with 1,464 feet, and then you got Meta Creek, which is a 82, almost 8,300 foot that yeah. needs water. Yep. And I don't expect you to know this, Andy, but I would hope that Dwayne would know where these roads fall or these fall on the priority list. I'd love to have water and sewer throughout this county, but that's not possible. But I would hope that that area is growing like crazy. I would hope that we would uh, make sure that if they're not being focused on, that we would focus on. Yeah, absolutely. And Meadow Creek is one area that has that we've looked at previously that Dwayne actually brought to you, I think, a year or so ago when we looked at Webro. Wet Meadow Creek was one of those areas. Um, so it is definitely being looked at. Um, I know the board is proposing or contemplating the sale of its home health uh, agency. And, um, you know, you're going to, you know, there's going to be some significant proceeds from that. I think one of the biggest public health issues we have in this community is public water and people's well water. I think it would be very prudent for this board to set aside some portion of that, those proceeds to continue to expand water in these areas that you've talked about, Bill. And it's not just in the locust area. There's areas, you know, down in the, you know, the, um, southeastern part of the county there's areas you know not too far from albemarle uh there's areas as you go towards baden i mean there there are multiple areas i think you know um that that's something that this board should give some considerable thought to as you contemplate that sale is that you know you're using you're selling a public health asset you could reinvest those into another public health issue which to me is that um is 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 the issue with water quality and the arsenic and other things that we have in this community just some food for thought but you know if you did that you would be able to address some additional areas um because that'll happen quicker than these water and sewer authority projects to be honest with you unfortunately we run these down these roads and a lot of these folks don't tap on and we charge an availability fee but if they're not paying for their water um in addition to that availability fee, or if they're just paying, not in addition, but if they're just paying that availability fee, it really makes these projects really difficult to cash flow. And by, based on the USDA covenants, you have to get to have a, a certain percentage of your revenue above and beyond your debt service. And we don't meet that for several years. And so we don't, the LGC won't even allow us to take on additional water and sewer authority projects, which is one of the reasons why we haven't done a project probably in at least four or five years, the last one being the mission area, because it takes so long for us to build up our resources so that those that we're in a situation where we're covering that debt service per USDA bond covenants. And so the same thing will happen then with this water and sewer authority project. We'll do this project and it'll likely be four years from now before we can contemplate a phase five, just because it takes so long because not everybody that we run this water down is going to, we, we, we assume everybody's going to do it, but they don't. And then they have, we charge them a availability fee. Some folks pay it, some folks don't. And so, um, you know, and that, the, you know, these are expensive, you know, at 80, at, at $80, hours, you know, uh, you know, um, that preliminary foot. I mean, these are expensive projects. They add up quick. So, uh, especially when you're talking miles and miles that we are with these water and sewer authority projects. So just some food for thought, but yes, Bill, to answer your question in short, these are all areas that we're looking at and trying to figure out how we close the gap. I think the, the, the project that Commissioner Furr is bringing forward this evening was one of the ones that you were contemplating a bit last time with Webb Road. Um, I think there were Frick Road, there was an area on Green in, in Frog Pond, there was a road there, there was Boss Road, um, there was Webb Road, and then there was an, another road. And so both of those, there was sort of the top six that they brought you. Um, so Boss Road was one of those projects before that was sort of a higher priority. Any other questions, Mr. Chairman? I just, I mean, I understand there's other locations too. I know Parker Road and Indy still is one that Scott residents has been asking for years. Um, but I will say as far as this road goes, since I'm on the water and sewer, that one of the things that was brought up about this particular road is it's a redundant, it gives us redundancy going out west because you got, now you'll connect Canton Road with 2427. So if there was anything in between that went bad, they could reroute that water around. So that's why this road was being looked at more than other roads just for the simple fact of the redundancy. That. That's correct. And obviously this piece of it doesn't connect it, but it gets you closer to being connected. I mean, it gets you 
two hundred thousand dollars and you know uh, you know a couple thousand feet closer to being to being redundant. So yes, it, no, it it doesn't accomplish the goal of redundancy, but it gets you closer to the goal of redundancy. It wouldn't be redundant. It'd just be close the loop. It would close a loop. It wasn't. It wouldn't help from a redundancy perspective because the water's already out there. Any other questions? Mr. Chair, I'll make. Um, I know we set out to say we would set aside 200, 250,000 every year to try to do little projects like this. So I'll make the motion. Um, to proceed with Balch Road. Second. Motion from Commissioner Morgan to proceed um, um, and authorize staff to initiate the engineering and subsequent construction for an area of water line on Balch Road not to exceed 200,000. Right. Second from Commissioner Jordan. Is there any other discussion from board members? Just one, one question, and I know this was supposed to be under phase four. It's phase four still online to hopefully get approved by the end of the year yeah the goal we, we've submitted our package it's my understanding from talking to wayne and steven the package has been submitted obviously things aren't as things aren't flowing through the federal government because of covid and other things as quickly as as normal um we are anticipating an answer fourth quarter 2020 first quarter 2021 early part of first quarter 2021 that's that's when we hope that our package will be some will be uh, approved by the USDA. It'll go through LGC. We'll get it out to bid and award the contract. Then obviously I'll um, and get that project started. Any other questions, comments, discussion? All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? No. Motion will carry seven to zero. Item number seven is the NCACC legislative goals. County Manager Lucas. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Um, each year, well, each biennium, the North Carolina Association of County Commissioners develops its uh, sort of adv adv advocacy platform for the top goals that it's going to sort of target with the General Assembly. Uh, and they always ask counties uh, for goal submissions. Our goals are due by October 15th. I can just tell you that broadband um, is already something that's going to be, you know, that, that's already a, a statewide, you know, association goal. So us submitting that, is, I mean, that, that's already there. Um, you know, obviously more money for rural infrastructure projects is already already a goal. Um, so, um, but if there's other things that you can think of that you would like to, um, that you'd like to submit, just get those to me prior to uh, October 15th, because that deadline's before our next board meeting on the 19th. So I wanted to bring it to you in case this board had specific things that you felt like we need to be lobbying or the our county association needs to be lobbying the General Assembly for, whether that be more, more funding for education or whatever it may be that you feel like we need to, counties need to prioritize with the General Assembly as they enter into their 2021-2022 biennium, which will obviously start in January when they go back into session. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Are there any questions? If there's no objection from the board, um, we could move forward if, if you have a potential legislative goal that you are interested in advocating for to send it to county staff to submit. I think is, you know. Then they have a whole conference and they prioritize them and vote on them and there's a whole process. Just because we submit it doesn't mean it'll get prioritized. Ashley's been before. So it's a long, it's about a two day process. All right, so if there's no objection, if you have a legislative goal, you may submit that to staff and uh, have them send it on our behalf. Uh, item number eight is the consent agenda. Any revisions or changes to the consent agenda? If motion to approve. There's a motion to approve from Commissioner Allman, a second from Commissioner Morgan. Is there any discussion on the motion to approve? All in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed, no. Motion carries seven to zero. Uh, that brings us to public comment. Is there anybody here to speak during public comment this evening? 
That brings us to board comments, announcements, and committee reports. We'll start with uh, Commissioner Ferg. Just have one short one. I'd like to show my mask. Showed that uh, I approve our men and women in in blue. Thank you, Commissioner Ferg. Commissioner Allman. No comment. Commissioner Morgan. No comment. Commissioner Lawhon. No comment. Commissioner Jordan. We can Commissioner <laughs> <laughs> Barbie. No comment. <laughs> and I have no comment either. Um, the board's approval will seek a motion to re enter closed session to consult with our county attorney in accordance with General Statute 143318.1183. Discuss personnel issue uh, 143318.11A5. A6, I'm sorry. Motion. Is there a second? Second. All in favor say aye. aye. We'll stand in a five minute recess and convene in the closed session. General session of the county commissioner meeting back to order. Um, recognize Commissioner Jordan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I would like to consider and approve the realignment slash transfer of the county's animal control service from the health department to the sheriff's office effective October 6, 2020, and review and consider the approval of the, of the budget amendment associated with that transfer from the health department to the sheriff's office. There's a motion on the table to approve the realignment and transfer of the county animal control from the health department to the sheriff's office effective October 6, 2020, and approve the attached budget amendment uh, associated with the, that transfer. There is a second from Commissioner Morgan is there any discussion? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed, no. Motion will carry seven to zero. Seek a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Is there a second? Second. A second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Meeting stands adjourned. Aye.